and you now have the floor. Awesome. So, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Mackenzie Warren, and I'm really, really happy to be here with you guys today, albeit virtually. Uh, my preference is definitely to be in person with students, but um, given COVID and also given the fact that I am currently in North Carolina um, going to school at Duke University, I'm a first year here, um, it kind of makes it a little bit difficult for me to just take a flight over there to, to school in Houston. So this will just have to do for today. Um, but what I want to first do is, Ms. Carp, what grade level am I talking to? Everyone is in 12th grade. Okay, awesome. So I just, because I heard you say they're taking SAT, so I didn't know. Um, I, I I mean, I guess that's, that's definitely a possibility, but okay. I just didn't know it was like maybe, maybe juniors are doing it as well. Awesome. So nice to meet you, everybody. You guys are also extremely close to what I'm experiencing right now. So in a matter of months, really, you'll also be on a, hopefully on a college campus if, if you're deciding to go that route. Um, but to give you a bit, a bit of background information on me, like I said, my name is McKenzie. I graduated from high school in 2019, so I was class of 2019, and I took a gap year uh, just this past year, and so I'm supposed to be a sophomore in college, but that was not the route that I chose to go, partly because um, I graduated at 16 16 years, sorry, my lunch is just like not settling well. So I graduated at 16 years old and um, I'm now 18. So um, I turned 17 over my gap year. So that's just a little bit of information about me. Um, I also went to Carnegie Vanguard High School. Not sure if any of you guys are familiar with that. And I also can't see your faces. So I can't tell if you're like, yeah, I definitely know that school or no, you don't. But um, regardless, yeah, I graduated salutatorian of my class. Um, I'm at Duke University and um, hopefully this just establishes a little bit of credibility with you guys, but I was also admitted into 13 other highly selective universities, Vanderbilt, University of Virginia, Rice, UT Austin Honors Program, um, Emory, Wash U, so maybe different schools that you guys are also considering, and so hopefully um, that'll give me a little bit of clout when I'm, you know, providing information for you today and incentivize you to really take what I'm saying and, and take it to heart and listen to it. So without further ado, what we're going to be discussing today is this theme of communication, right? And I talked to Ms. Carp before I started preparing for my presentation. Uh, and so hopefully this will marry very well with what you guys are covering in, in class, given that I believe one of the guiding questions that she told me you guys are focusing on is, why is clear communication so important, especially in the professional atmosphere? So we're going to really dive into that today and also connect that to the academic atmosphere, which you guys are, you know, we're, we're all in. Um, me being a college student, you guys about to fly the, the high school coop um, type of thing. So communication is just important on a, on a daily basis and kind of speaking in those larger general themes as well. So what I want to first do just to kind of elicit some sort of audience participation here uh, is let's just establish kind of what communication is and why it's important. So if I could have a volunteer tell me, like, what even is communication? Like, like what does it entail? You don't have to, like, raise your hand either because I can't tell how all of that works. So just, like, unmute and just go for it. Um, when information is passed but between two individuals or a group of people. Yes. That's great. See, I'm glad you unmuted yourself. Don't be shy, y'all. You, you most likely have the answer to these questions. So yes, thank you for sharing. That was perfect. Um, so when information is passed between two people, right? So I think that was a, a great definition. And, and really what communication is, maybe just to put it in a different way, is it's a way of expressing ourselves, right? Expressing information, expressing thoughts, feelings, whatever it is that's in our mind, expressing it to somebody else so that they can perceive it, right? So in order for communication to really be, uh, actually be more than just me making noise and, and me just like doing different behaviors and things, is that there's also this element of communication being perceived, right? That's the only way for that information to be understood. So there's kind of this two elements going into this whole communication theme of the person that's actually doing the communicating and the person that's actually perceiving the communication. So forms of communication. Let me list the, 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 the top three, the fundamental three, and that is verbal communication. So what I'm doing right now, um, 
because I'm talking to you guys, right? I'm sharing information via words, right? Via verbal words, oral words. Uh, another form of communication, the second one that we're going to be touching on today is written communication. Whenever we are, you know, writing an email or sending a text message or making a post on social media or, you know, really anything that involves me putting words to a page, whether that's typing them or writing them, et cetera, right? And the third one that we're going to touch on today that a lot of people take for granted, but it is definitely a form of expression is body language. So how are, you know, when you walk into a room, are, are you exuding this aura of confidence? Is your, is your back straight? Are you sitting up? Um, you know, your, your stride is long, you know, your head's up, you know, or are you just kind of like meek and mild, just kind of rolling in, head down, you know, kind of want to blend in with the shadows? What is your body language communicating about you and what are you communicating via your body language? Right. So that's a little bit of a double entendre there. But what communication really is and why it's so important is because it allows for it's, it's a way of forming impressions. Right. So when we first meet somebody, we have no idea who who they are. We are going to go off of different clues. Right. What are they saying? How are they talking? How are they behaving? Well, what, what is their body and, and the way that they're expressing themselves? What is it telling me about them? And then from there, I can form these different impressions about the person. So maybe my impression is, you know, okay, they're really confident or uh, they not so much. So they, they seem a little timid or uh, right now, hopefully I'm giving off the vibe that I'm a very credible person and that um, you guys would benefit from hearing about what I have to say. So People, communication in the way that you're communicating allows for people to make assumptions about your confidence, your credibility, even your likability, right? So if you seem like somebody that's cold and calloused and that's how you're talking and you just kind of have this ruthless way about you, well, people are probably going to be like, okay, yeah, maybe that person's going to get stuff done, but I don't want to be their friend. Like they seem a little, you know, a little too cool and tough for me, right? So all of communication is really all about the way that you're presenting yourself. And it is important because it allows for other people to kind of perceive your vibe and, and make different assumptions about you. So let's go ahead and, and jump right into the, that, the, the previous thing that I just mentioned about communication, having this, this dual, um, dual take of it involves both the person that is doing the communicating and the perceiving. So what I want to say on that aspect is for somebody to be a good perceiver of communication, well, that involves them being an active listener, right? And so what I want somebody to do right now is really define, like, what is the difference between merely hearing what somebody is saying or, you know, just kind of, yeah, just merely hearing or actually listening to what somebody's saying? What's, what's the key difference between those two words, hearing versus listening? Anybody can jump in. When you like hear somebody, like you just hear them talking, like you're not really paying attention. Like mm -hmm. when you're like listening, like like you're understanding what they're saying so you can know what you can say back to them and stuff. Yeah, Alexis, you hit the nail on the head right there with that one. Yes, that's perfect. So basically hearing, you can hear noise. You don't have to pay attention to noise. You don't even have to pers really, when you when you're just hearing something it just goes it's it embodies that saying of in one ear and out the other you don't pay it any mind you don't really care and it's just kind of like background fluff right it's just noise versus when you're listening to somebody you're actively perceiving processing comprehending and kind of grappling with that information in your mind and trying to really make sense of it and, and apply it to your everyday experience and so you can figure out how do I respond to this person, right? So it actually involves that element of attention and processing. So let's go ahead and, and apply what we've learned thus far to the college and scholarship application process. So you guys are seniors. You're really in the thick of it now. For those of you who might be applying to early decision system schools, you've probably already submitted some essays. Maybe even as juniors, you've already submitted scholarship essays. Uh, but I know that the... January deadline for just like kind of across the board if you're kind of going just like the normal regular decision uh, route is around the corner. So you guys are definitely in the thick of banging out those essays and getting that stuff done. So the first thing that I want to touch on is the this this written element that goes into the college and scholarship application essay process. So what 
is the purpose of these essays? Well, why, why do they even matter? Why are we encouraged to just put so much of our effort and attention um, and time into them? Well, primary reason is that when you submit this stuff and, and you become an applicant in this pool of other applicants, right? Your essay is a means of the admissions committee or, or the, the review committees to really get to know you beyond what your numbers are saying about you. And by numbers, I'm talking GPA, I'm talking standardized test scores, AP scores, all that stuff. You know, that there's this there's this fine line of that your essay should embody that you're more than just a statistic, right? Your essay should, should show that you're a story. You're a person, you're a person, you're human, right? You're not just, you know, a, a, 15, a 1600 on, on your SAT or, you know, the top of your class. You, you have dimension, you're 3D. And it's really important that these essays kind of capture this theme because you unfortunately do not get the opportunity to be in the room when these people are reading your your application profile uh, you know they're purely going based off of the words that you're saying about yourself and trying to figure out what makes you special what makes you human um and you can't actually advocate for yourself by by being present so that's why your essays have to really carry this powerful punch and and shed light on you know, what's your background? What are the different perspectives that, you, that you're going to be bringing to the table? You know, what drives you? What makes you vulnerable? What are your strengths, your weaknesses? And, and what are some of the experiences that you've had that have really shaped your, your cultural being? So that's, um, that's kind of what the purpose of your essays are to serve. And so now let's kind of just get into what I want to ask you guys now is maybe what have you found hard about writing these essays what's what's been a challenge that you've faced um sort of so far in in this process i can say from i've wrote my personal statement about five times mm -hmm. and i wouldn't say it's hard writing about yourself but to put something on a piece of paper that the college admissions just wanting from you because it's like you have to advocate for yourself mm -hmm. so it's time it's kind of hard to say okay this is me and this is like me. It's hard to find something very particular that defines you. That's definitely a very um, valid concern that you have there. And I know that not everybody piped up, but I'm sure that y'all are all in the same boat. And I was once in that boat as well when I was going through the college application process. And so hopefully when I tell you this, I'm going to be giving you some strategies throughout to, to sort of help you as you craft your essays and as you figure out what should I say, what's most important, what do I leave out, you know, wh whatever the, the situation is. Um, but, but the one thing that I want to say up front is I sort of had like this sniff test or kind of like this, you know, when something passes the sniff test, you're like, okay, yeah, I guess I, I'll wear it today. Like, even though it's been like, I've worn it for the past three days, but it doesn't stink. It doesn't stink. So I'll put it on again. Right. So passes this sniff test for your essays, which kind of like is is an indicator of, okay, I can press go, I can submit this essay, is two things, right? You want your essay to, on a fundamental level, be interesting, right? People need to think thousands upon thousands of students are submitting essays just like you are. Okay, these these uh, these admissions people are sitting in this room probably hours on end, they might be cranky, like whatever, and they're just papers crossing their desk one after the other, one after the other, for when they get to your essay, for time to just stop and them to be like, whoa, this essay just woke me up. Like I'm feeling energized. Like I am just hanging on to this person's every word. That's how captivating whatever it is that you were talking about was, right? So you're not merely just like, I'm the latest and the greatest, you know, I'm a leader, I'm blah, blah, blah. You want to tell a story. You want the person to be invested and feel like, oh, I, I just can't get enough. Like, I just want more, right? So interesting. And the second thing is your essay, this will kind of, this, this should kind of help you figure out and discern what is it that I should talk about? What kind of traits about me are, are important? Because the other, the other purpose that your essay needs to serve is that it gives your readers this undeniable urge to meet you in person, meaning they're like, whoa, just from this person's papers, just from this person's personal statement, I like want to know them. Like I already feel like I know them, but I'm ready to put a face and a 3D body behind this paper, right? I just want to bring this person into my office right now and, and just have a conversation with them. So two things, interesting 
two things interesting. And the second thing is making that person have this undeniable urge to say, yes, I want to fly them into my office and like have them on a plane, come see me right now at this minute. Okay, the second thing and kind of addressing um, the concern that was that was just brought up about, you know, a challenge that we faced during the, the when we were crafting these essays is you want your essays to address whatever these colleges or these scholarships are envisioning to be their their ideal applicant. Right. So these schools, they, you know, they say, hey, you know, we, we want diversity. We want people from all different backgrounds, so on and so forth. Scholarships, you know, same thing. But at the end of the day, there's a common thread that weaves together everybody that receives an acceptance, everybody that receives money. And whatever that common thread is, it's it's might be you know common across several different schools and several different scholarships, or it's very specific to that school. But some, some different common threads that, that I've just noticed from my time, it's like these people are looking for leaders, right? They're looking for um, people who can influence and impact others in a positive way, right? They're looking for people who are service oriented, who want to use their skills, their strengths to benefit and uplift other people, right? Who maybe don't have the same amount of resources or, you know, who may be struggling in some sort of aspect, right? They're looking for people who are curious by we hear this word intellectually curious well what that means here at duke is people who are willing to explore really get out of their their comfort zone and and not just come in with this boxed in sort of mentality of like i just want to do this and that's all i'm doing but having a really open mind and, and wanting to learn about the world around you and the people that are in it and, and everything that's happening so it's this curiosity but the thing that i encourage you to do is is really just go and look and research these schools that you're applying to and research these scholarships that you're applying to. And maybe that means you're reading the profile of people that have like, on, especially on scholarship pages, they have like, okay, class of 2019 recipients or whatever, go and read their pages and see, okay, looks like a lot of these people are, you know, demonstrate an immense amount of creativity and ingenuity. Okay, so they're looking for people who are, you know, catalysts for social change and are who are doing something creative to, to bring about that change, maybe founding a nonprofit or something like that. So going and looking and seeing what is this school's scholarships, whatever, what is their ideal applicant and not how can I change myself to fit that or how can I lie about myself to make myself fit that? No, we're, we're trying to be authentic here, but that should shape the experiences that you're talking about because I get it there's just there's so much depth to us as humans we've had so many things happen in our 18 years 17 18 years of life and it's like whoa what what's important well that should guide what experiences you need to be plucking from your life thus far because they should in some way shape or form align with whatever these schools scholarships are placing a premium on or are valuing in applicants. Okay. So hopefully that's making sense thus far. Another thing that I want to um, really just encourage you guys to do as you go through this essay process is <clears throat> start writing early. Okay. We're still, you're still in October. You guys are doing well. If you haven't started already, you need to start now. Like maybe that's today or something, you know, to that effect or this weekend. And I say that because one, in order for you to have effective communication, that requires, especially with these essays in which there are word counts and all this stuff, and you can't just like word vomit everything, you want to make sure that every single word that you have on that page is purposeful, serves some sort of purpose, has meaning. It's not just there filling up space. Right. And so how you can get to that point where it's enhanced and it's refined and and the way that you're communicating is succinct, yet just detailed enough where, you know, you give this person context is by writing it, kind of trying to crank it out in one go, perhaps, and then leaving it and leaving time for you to to kind of ponder whatever it is that that you've you've written. And the thing is, is for for that information to circulate in your head, it doesn't require for you to actively be thinking about it, just taking time away from your assignment is going to you're going to unconsciously and subconsciously really be processing that information in your head so that when you go back you have a different perspective you might be like mm, i don't really like the way that sentence is worded mm, i want to kind of shift some xyz around i think this will make it um you know more clear whatever it is that i'm trying to express so leave, starting early leaves back leaves time for um you to go back and, and do revisions 
it also leaves time for you to ask people to proofread your essays. And so what's the importance of having somebody proofread your essay? Well, I want to caution you now from, you know, having your parents or your best friend, you know, read your essay just so that they can like give you their own words to put, right? You know, sometimes our parents have this habit of being like, mm, I don't really like the way that's worded. You should say it like this instead. And sometimes that's good. They're, they're giving like accurate grammatical advice, but other times it's just a matter of style, right? And you never want to conform your style, your writing style specifically, or really any type of style that you have, to what somebody else wants from you. Because the thing about these essays, it's like I said, they're supposed to give these college admissions committees and these scholarship committees a really good idea of who you are, meaning your voice and your voice only should be the one that is kind of shining through throughout the whole thing. And so to kind of give you an example, I'm from the South. I'm from Texas. You know, I say you guys are from Texas. I say y'all, and that's okay. I'm going to put that in my writing because that's a part of who I am, right? Another thing is I'm somebody that loves figurative language, and you might hear me say it, say, you know, different metaphors and analogies and similes today because that's just part of the way I speak. And so I'm not afraid to you know, put that sort of style and that sort of flair in my writing because that's an accurate depiction of who I am and how I speak. And nobody's going to be surprised when they pull me into a room and talk to me in person and I'm just like spitting metaphors left and right. They'll have a pretty good idea of that just from my writing, right? So the purpose of having somebody proofread is not to have them take away from your authenticity shining through your writing, but instead it's to make sure that before you press go and send this essay off, you know, into the wind for the for these people to look at, that you that your message is very, very clear and that whatever it is that you are trying to communicate is going to be accurately perceived. Meaning that sometimes when we're doing our writing, we get so close to it, we get so invested that we have this tendency to not fully explain ourselves, right? We just, oh, that person will get it. You know, they've asked me this question and I haven't provided all of the, the contextual details to, to really make sure that this person has a very good understanding of what I'm saying. And you just assume that they are, and, and, and this is usually a subconscious um, assumption, but you just assume that they're in your head and that they can read your mind and that they'll get it without you being very, very explicit. And so that's why you want to have somebody maybe who knows you or even somebody that doesn't know you and, and you have them read your essay and you say, okay, so what did you get from this essay? What are the themes that you think I'm trying to um, lift up? What, what kind of characteristics are uh, am I shedding light on in this essay? And if they're saying all the things that you were, you know, intentionally that, that was that was aligned with your intention, then you're on the right track. If you were really wanting to showcase that you're a hardworking person and the person that you had proofread it said, yeah, I really gathered that you're hardworking and determined and so on and so forth, then you're on the right track. But if they're like, um, I gathered that you, you know, really just like to go to the beach, well, and you were trying to kind of uplift this theme of you being hardworking, well, there's a disconnect there and that's a problem and you're going to need to go back and, and revise and rework and perhaps add some more details or, or some additional explanation so that ultimately your intention is accurately perceived. So that's the importance of having somebody proofread, right? Another thing that I want you guys to understand, um, and this will really help you figure out, okay, what are the themes, what are the, um, what are the, the different parts of my experience that I want to be showcasing in my application portfolio? Well, all of your experiences should be related in some way. They, they should be tied together by some sort of central theme. And right, your central theme does not have to be the, you know, the same as your buddies, right? My central theme was leadership. I'm, you know, somebody that prides myself on, on being a leader and being a change maker and, you know, helping others through my leadership, right? And so your theme might be something different. Your theme might be, you know, resilience. I'm somebody that hasn't had the, the easiest cut in life, but I've made it work and I've still been successful. And this is how I've still made some sort of impact on my community. So that might be your theme. It doesn't matter, but as long as there's some sort of common denominator, right? That, that demonstrates coherency, right? And once you think about a novel, right? We have different chapters. All the chapters are talking about different things, 
but you know that they are a part of the same story. It's not like, you know, you have this one book and it seems like there's all like these, unless this is in, intentional by, you know, some books are, they have a bunch of different short stories that are unrelated, but most books, all the chapters are tied together by this overarching story. It makes the novel coherent, right? It makes it easy for the readers to connect the dots because the characters are the same and, and the, the, the general plot, while it's taking different directions, you still have an understanding of what the heyday is going on, right? So your essays and your individual, you know, your supplementals and your personal statement, they should all not be talking about the same thing. I'm definitely not saying that. You shouldn't write about, you know, the same experience more than one time, but they should be tied together by some sort of central theme. They should all be related to some sort of larger idea in some way so that your reader is not like, huh, I feel like I was given a bunch of puzzle pieces, but they're not making a picture. You really want to connect those dots for them, right? Now, another thing that I want to um, get into here is just transparency, right? Like I said, you want to make sure that you're bringing your voice to life in your writing um, and, and making sure that you add your own individual level of, of creativity and, and not being afraid to break break grammar etiquette if, if that's just like how you are like sometimes just for dramatic effect you might just have a one word sentence or something like that so adding a little bit of flair and creativity goes a long way in terms of making your writing captivating but the other thing that you want to make sure that you're doing kind of in tandem with this this lens of transparency and honesty it is yes you are putting your best foot and your best face forward right you're presenting yourself in the most favorable light and you're drawing attention to these qualities that you possess that will allow you to set yourself apart from your competition but you're also not forgetting that you're navigating this really fine line of what i like to call the humble brag and honestly i know it's an oxymoron because you're like how can you be humble but also be bragging about yourself just trust me you can do it and the way that you do it is by not outright saying things like you know, I'm the latest and greatest, you know, I'm, I'm the best there is, right? Um, you know, making people feel that just that just really kind of, it's very off putting for people when you're when you're arrogant, you want to be confident, but not arrogant. So that's kind of what I'm getting at when I say this, this humble brag where you're like, yeah, you know, I've done XYZ, and you're not afraid to list your achievements, but you're not saying it in a way that's very um, braggadocious, as, as I like to put it, right? You're adding context and you're you're answering their question um but doing it in that that very humble sort of way that's that's you know that people can appreciate people appreciate confident people not arrogant people so just keeping that in mind um now the other thing that i just wanted to to quickly touch on before we transition to our next part of the presentation is also, just don't forget to take advantage of the additional information section of the application. And the reason I say that is because really the golden rule that you should just be keeping in your mind as, as you navigate these process, the, the college application, the scholarship application processes is that you're trying to put together this, this quality package, this, this really, this package that encapsulates everything that you are and you're selling yourself, right? And so sometimes that means that you need to provide a little bit of extra information about yourself and maybe that's in your additional info section where you are talking about a particular circumstance that sheds light on well i wasn't able to perform to, to the best of my academic ability during my sophomore year because you know my my mom was in the hospital or i was working a job to help put food on on the table for my brothers and sisters because my mom also she's she's never home because she's working xyz no amount of jobs and my dad's not at the house or whatever so explaining your circumstances in some sort of way is a way to utilize the additional information section but also just keeping in mind that since you are trying to leave no stone unturned and in, in crafting this quality package that um, sheds light on these different dimensions of who you are, you're never going to want to write an essay about the same thing twice, right? So even if, you know, you have some sort of experience and, you know, it can be used to answer two different questions, don't do it. Like I said, talk about different things, showcase different aspects of who you are, but the way that you keep things consistent is by having that overarching theme. So you want to make sure that you're, show, you're showcasing Di you, the, the different dimensions of your person your persona by talking about your different experiences but like i said keeping things coherent by having that overarching theme now moving into uh and actually let me because now we're about to get into kind of verbal communication i want to just kind of check in with you guys see what's up do we have any questions so far um i know i'm talking fast that's just kind of how i am um but also for the sake of time i just want to get through this information so do we have any questions from the audience thus far
just feel free to unmute. It's okay to say no. It is okay to say no. No. Okay, let's keep it trucking then. Um, and I'm gonna have to do, I'm, I'm gonna get some audience participation going in here because y'all have been quiet on me and I don't like it because I can't, I can't even see y'all. So I gotta make sure that you're still engaged. Um, all right, so interviews. This is the next like, big way to showcase your verbal communication skills, interviews and, and presentations as well. So what's the purpose of an interview, folks? What what do you think um, an interview is for and how might the purpose of it compare to what you're trying to showcase in your, your essays that you're writing? Okay, I might need to repeat the question again because I you, some of you probably, probably are like, uh, this girl is going way too fast. What did she even say? That's okay. So I said, what's the purpose of an interview? Does anybody want to, you know, maybe you've had an interview experience um, and what did you think that the purpose of it was? Uh, they can get to know you. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, leave the job or whatever. that's right. So they can get to know you. Um, so what I like to say is that an interview is an opportunity for you to not just like so somebody can get to know you, but also so that you can prove who you say you are, right? And the reason I say this is because a lot of the time before you're invited, the interview is the next step. Like that's like, okay, your foot is in the door if you've gotten an interview. And that's because like when you're applying to a job, you usually submit your application first or your resume. Same thing with colleges. You're usually turning in some sort of essay and then they're coupling that or like, you know, coupling that with your interview stuff. So interview is usually that, that next phase showing somebody, hey, like we're interested, right? And so it's the opportunity for them to say, okay, whatever, you know, they were showcasing, whatever skills um, seems to be pretty prominent in their, their writing or their resume or their application, let me bring them in the room and see if they're actually kind of walking the walk, walking the talk sort of thing. Now, one of the, the, the biggest things that you'll, if, if you've had quite a few, if you've had, if you're pretty experienced with doing interviews, you'll know that there's a common a uh, question that you can ex usually expect to be asked, and that is, this is at the beginning, and it's, tell me about yourself, right? And it's usually a, a 30 to 45 second spiel, what I like to call your own personal elevator pitch. And the reason I call it an elevator pitch, or I mean, other people call it an elevator pitch, that's not my own like unique ter terming, um, but it's called an elevator pitch because when you're in the elevator going from the first floor to the fourth floor, you're probably not gonna be in there with them for more than a minute. Right. And so if they ask you a question, you want to make sure that you get that information out in a succinct fashion, in a very coherent fashion um, and make sure that they have an understanding. So that is your opportunity to give your own personal elevator pitch. So question for you guys, if somebody says, tell me about yourself and they don't give any other additional information, what are you most likely to talk about? This is an open ended question, so please pipe up. <laughs> Nobody, nobody wants to say anything. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, I definitely can. If somebody says to you in an interview, tell me about yourself, what are you most likely to say? Are you going to talk about, you know, your experiences? Are you going to talk about your skill set? What are, what are you going to say? You're going to talk about your family? What do you, what, how do you respond personally? <clears throat> talk, about, talk about skills. To talk about your achievements. Yeah, yeah, these are all like very good things that I'm hearing. Your skills, your achievements, your experiences, so on and so forth. So yeah, it's intentionally left very open-ended because I assume the interviewer just wants to see where you're gonna go with this. But what I like to say, kind of my guiding strategy is you never really can go wrong with just merely and purely highlighting the qualities that you possess and the experiences that you've had, so a little bit of both, that make you a good fit for the job or the the thing that you're being considered for, right? So just, um, I have an interview actually today and I'm applying for this program and the, I had a first round interview and then when they asked me, tell me about yourself, I brought up, you know, a couple of experiences that I just had during my gap year that marry with the things that they value in, in the people that they 
um, invite into this program, right? So things like being um, a catalyst for social change. I talked about an experience that I've had that kind of demonstrates and exemplifies that. So maybe if you're applying to a job or you're in a college interview and they're like, so tell me about yourself. You might talk about your family life potentially to, to showcase your diversity that you're bringing to the table. You might talk about, you know, yeah, I'm really hardworking and this is a time that demonstrates that because uh, being hardworking is definitely something that's going to enable your success in a college environment. So just thinking about the different qualities that you possess and the experiences that you've had that make you a good fit for whatever you're being considered for. You can never go wrong with that. Um, and just making sure that you keep it to that 30 to 45 second maximum. Do not just go rambling on these people and just start, you know, really just listing off all of this random stuff and they're just like looking at you like whoa you've been talking for two minutes now that's why i say you probably should have a good idea of your elevator pitch in advance don't like rehearse it or anything so that it sounds like very stilted and, and robotic but you want to make sure you kind of know what your general points are so that you are able to be very concise clear articulate succinct in how you're expressing yourself now like i just said be mindful of how long you are talking whenever somebody asks you a question you don't want to just you, you, there's this fine line of providing just enough detail that, that contextualizes and and provides explanations so if somebody says so tell me about your strength and you just say i'm a leader well that doesn't really give a lot of detail they, they you're probably going to leave the person wanting like a little bit more like do you actually care about this job? Because you would be saying more if you did, or do you care about this college or whatever? So making sure that you're providing detail, but that you're not just rambling on and on and on and you seem very scatterbrained and just um, very unorganized in your thoughts. Um, you definitely don't want to do that. And you want to make sure that you're not losing sight of the question. So if they ask you about your strength and you're talking about your weaknesses, well, um, that's going to be an issue because you're not even answering what you've been asked right also i'm somebody that tends to be a little bit long-winded and so a strategy that i use is just checking in with the person if i'm if i can actually see them i look at their body language are they you know looking around while i'm like a minute into my answer are they you know kind of sl slouched down or just like looking you know just kind of seem real lazy with their body language or whatever where they seem a little bit checked out yeah, well, that's a problem. That means I need to stop talking and kind of turn the floor over to them, right? If you're on the phone with somebody and you unfortunately can't see their, their body language, you know, and you know that you've been talking for a while, acknowledge that. Say, look, I know I'm, I'm, I apologize for, for giving a sort of long-winded answer there. Um, I, I know that I was talking a lot, but I want to go ahead and receive your input or see your thoughts or whatever. Um, just, you know, just doing some sort of check-in to make sure that the person is, is still following your, hey, have I lost you? I know I've been talking a lot, but have I lost you yet? You know, being, being a little jokey about it too can 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 make things a little bit less awkward. Um, I would also say just because on this, on this note of the way that you're expressing yourself and the way that you're presenting yourself um, are very important in in helping people craft their assumptions and, and the impressions that you make on them. There are some just fundamental things that, that you need to make sure you're doing. Arriving early. 10 to 15 minutes early is, is just enough. You don't need to be sitting at the Starbucks or on the Zoom call an hour in advance or anything. Um, you know, bringing your resume is always going to be super helpful, especially if the interviewer comes and doesn't really have a plan. Bringing a resume so that it maybe can follow along or ask you about specific experiences. And also wearing professional attire. So boys i'm not telling you to roll up in a suit or anything but you know a button down is nice or a collared t-shirt is nice or you know, maybe some slacks just show that you didn't just like roll up roll out of your bed and just like walk into this this interview or show up on this call and, and you haven't given any care to your appearance whatsoever right you want to make sure that you're looking quite kempt and and um just professional right so ladies that means whether you're a, a slacks type of girl or you know jeans or a skirt or a nice blouse or a dress or something like that just making sure that you show that you care you definitely do not want to it's better to overdress than underdress uh, for an interview also just be mindful of your uh, just how you're coming across so for things like if you need to take time to think don't be like, um, 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 like, 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 you know, those are pretty colloquial terms that us, um, you know, Gen Z people, we, we like to use, but it doesn't 
it doesn't um, shed light to the most sophisticated air when you're in an interview. So just being mindful of that. And if you need to take an opportunity to think, instead of saying, um, just, just be quiet. Just take a minute and just say, hey, can I have a minute to think about that? That's a really great question. And I want to give you a thoughtful answer. So taking the, that time and just letting the person know I need to think about this, that's okay. Right? Also, seeking clarification if you don't understand the question. Sometimes these questions can just come from left field and you're like, huh? What are you asking me? I want to make sure that I, and you're not going to ask it like that. That That's your internal voice telling you that, right? Um, so anyways, if, if you don't understand the question, make sure to seek clarification and say, I'm not really sure what you're asking me. Do you mind putting it in a different way? Or this is what I interpreted. Am I on the right track with how you want me to answer this or whatever? So it's better to answer the correct way than just like go off on some tangent. And they're like, honey, I didn't ask you about that, right? Another thing is just being perceptive of your interviewer's vibe. So hopefully by this point, folks, you can tell that I'm a very outgoing person. I'm very extroverted. And this is kind of the vibe that I bring into any setting that I'm in, right? And so you're going to have some interviewers who are like me, who are high energy, who are you know, real social, and that's perfectly fine, right? But you're also going to have some interviewers who are probably going to be a little bit harder to read. They're going to be more reserved, more introverted, and just kind of ask you your question and probably have a poker face. And you're like, I just tried to be funny there, like make a little joke and they didn't even laugh. Like I can't read anything that they're saying or on their face, right? So just being mindful of your interviewer's vibe and then adjusting your interview. So what I mean by that is I'll just give an example of myself. Whenever I'm in an interview with somebody whose energy is much, much, much lower than mine, well, I taper my energy a little bit. I'm not just, you know, as outgoing as I am right now. I'm still smiling. I'm still, you know, being inviting with my facial expressions and still demonstrating passion but at the same time i'm not trying to scare them by being so high energy right i you, you have to be mindful of those things right and then when i'm with somebody who is more like me i can still kind of be to the max my, myself right so just being mindful of those things as well is really important now on to this body language this theme of body language during an interview Whew, this is very important, people. So if one thing you you really take away from today, uh, you'll be doing interviews for the rest of your life. So please, please zone in here on what I'm about to say. So in an interview, you want to make sure that this, and some of these might be fundamental, and you might be like, McKinley, I already know this stuff, but it doesn't hurt to say it. And that is making sure that you're sitting up. Your torso needs to be at a 90 degree angle with your legs. You don't need to be hunched. You don't need to be like, you know, with your, I don't even know if you can see me guys. We'll see when I do this, but like, don't be sitting like this while they're talking to you. That's just, it's, it's unacceptable, right? So making sure that you're sitting up straight um, and, you know, not just like two lacks in your chair like this, that communicates the completely wrong thing if you're doing that. When you're, when you're sitting up straight, that shows that you're engaged. It shows that you are sophisticated, that you're professional, that you're confident. And those are all the signals that, that you want to be sending. Another thing is a little bit hard to do when, uh, you know, we're doing these, probably a lot of interviews now or, or via Zoom and stuff. But especially when you're in person, eye contact is a super, super, super big deal right it's kind of your window into your soul right so if i were talking to you guys like this the whole time and i was just like doing my presentation like this you'd be like where's this girl looking right so i'm trying to do a good job at least you know as much as you can do on on a computer with looking at the camera so you guys feel like i'm actually talking to you right so same thing goes in an interview make eye contact with the person or if you're afraid to look right into their pupils maybe like right here you know right between their eyebrows or something like that. Y'all know the, the hot spot that make them look like you're looking at them and not just like looking off and kind of, you know, when, when people are like looking around and stuff when you're talking to them, it kind of gives this vibe that they're a little shifty and shady and like not very trustworthy, right? So be mindful of that as well. Another thing is smile, okay? I hopefully I've done a good job of smiling with you guys today because I just, I really love um, connecting with students and, and kind of sharing my own experience. So make sure that you're doing the same thing during your interviews, you're smiling, you're having a very inviting facial expression. I know I have a bad habit of whenever I'm really listening to what somebody's saying, I tend to crinkle up my eyebrows and that's my like listening face. And I said, it's a bad habit because it looks like I'm very upset with the person, but I'm not. So just be, mind be mindful of, I'm probably doing it now. So I'm trying to kind of also monitor that in the background, but uh, just being mindful of what is your face communicating? Are you looking like what you said? Or are you like, you know, you're nodding along, you are, you're leaning in and your face is warm. And it, and it says, you know, it, it communicates that, that you're a nice, a nice, 
kind person, right? So like I said, be mindful of what your face is saying, making sure that you're leaning in slightly. I'm not saying like be all the way over on the table to show the person that you're listening to them, but just slightly leaning in. There's a difference between leaning in and like leaning out. When you're leaning out, that means you do not give a care about what this whoever you're talking to has to say but when you're leaned in that communicates to the person that okay this person is interested this person is engaged they're they're hanging on to my words here and and they're um understanding somewhat what i'm what i'm bringing to the table right also nodding your head a little bit you know i'm not saying just do this while the person is talking but if you've ever given a presentation or you know you just had a conversation with somebody there's a difference in how you feel as the person that's doing the actual communication if somebody's looking at you like this and they're like shaking their head. You're probably like, whoa, what did I say wrong? Like, where, where, where did I lose you? Versus if they're doing this, right? They're, they're nodding along a little bit. And, you know, they, just by that subtle movement of their head, that shows you that you have permission to keep going, that they're understanding and that they're listening. Okay. So be mindful of that as well. Another thing is just make sure to eliminate any to the best of your ability any nervous or fidgety behavior that you might have right so if you're like a leg bouncer and you know you don't want to look like you're just like shaking while this person is talking to you so being mindful of that if you're somebody that you know likes to play with your hair while you're nervous you're gonna have, maybe that means you need to just keep your hands clasped right in front of you like so and just kind of locking that so that you are not tempted to do that right so any nervous fidgety behavior that you might have cut it because you don't want to let anybody see you sweat. You don't want anybody to, you don't want to show anybody that you're nervous. Even it's, it's, good, it's a good thing to be nervous, right? That means you care, but you don't want to let that other person see it. And you don't want that to, to throw you off your game. So just be mindful of that as well. And kind of nipping that in the bud is really important. Two more things I have for you on this, this note of interviews is one, come with questions, right? When you're inquiring about the job or you're inquiring, you know, when, whenever you're meeting with perhaps an alumni interview of, of uh, an alumni interviewer of a school, coming with questions shows that you care, shows that you're interested, shows that you are invested, right? Now, I'm not saying bring a list of 50 questions, right? Because you probably won't even have time to get into any of those because you're the person being interviewed, right? But maybe coming with three, right? And three really good thought-provoking questions. I'm not saying just show up to this interview and be like, asking some sort of very common sense question like uh what what's the acceptance rate of xyz school that person's probably gonna look at you and be like uh bro sis you can go look that up online like that that's an easy google search right you want to come with something that you probably haven't heard before or ask them about their own individual experience how did you feel that you know your transition was from college into the workforce or what sort of activities did you do in college and, and how do you feel that the, the college provided a uh, did, did you feel like the college provided a plethora of opportunities for you to delve into or was it kind of limited in scope asking questions like those so that you care right so that's that as well and a final thing is it goes a long long way people to send a thank you note let the person know i appreciate your time and you can do that by just simply saying, hey, can I have your business card? At the end of the interview, hey, can I have your business card or your email address? I'd love to keep in touch with you as we, uh, as I continue in this application process and hopefully we'll be able to update you with good news, right? Saying something as simple as that and then once you have their email, sending them a quick email after the fact, right? And just thanking them for their time, right? Obviously, you want to thank them on the spot or in person or whatever. Be like, hey, you know, I really appreciate it, so on and so forth. But also, a thank you note that documents your appreciation goes a long way as well. Now, the fine line that you need to walk with this is you don't want to be chummy in the in the thank you note. Nobody likes somebody who's kind of a brown nose or, um, you know, the quote unquote teacher's pet or whatever, right? People realize when you're being chummy and your chumminess is coming across as insincere, right? So thank you so much. I know you had so much on your plate today and you know it just, it really meant a lot for you to take time out of your, like that's, that's a little too much, right? Just be appreciative and be genuine and just, just common, it's, this is common sense here people, but just, you know, being nice and brief in your email, show, showcasing your appreciation in that way. You don't need to write a, an essay to them about how great the, of an interviewer they've been. Like, it, it, it's not that deep. Just showing that you were thankful for their time is, is just enough. And maybe incorporating some sort of thing that they said that really resonated with you. Perhaps when you asked them 
your own questions and they talked about an experience that just adds that personal flair uh um just makes it personal right that it's not just like you just copy and pasted some random thank you note that you send to everybody uh, it, it adds that personal touch which is always goes a long way as well and thank you notes or something that us Generation Z kids, we don't do. And if, if, if it's not typical that we do it. And so when somebody does do it, it trust me, it goes a long way with an interviewer because they're like, wow, this person is, you know, just really thoughtful. That was, that was really nice of them. Right. So any questions at this point? Um, do we have any questions so far before I kind of move into the next element of the presentation? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Oh, okay. So, like, when you first when you first um got to college, like, what were like like the most problems that you had? What were the most problems that I had? Yeah, like difficulty, like probably like getting around or anything, or like. Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. So, I would say that fortunately, because I was admitted to Duke as as a part of the class of 2023, so I'm class of 2024 now. But like I said, I took a gap year, so I was admitted with class of 2023. So, with the current sophomores, and luckily that was like prior to COVID, right? So I had an opportunity to like actually come to Duke's campus. And so like getting around wasn't necessarily like a super like huge barrier for me. Cause I like had a map. I had visited campus like at least three times before I had gotten here. And so I kind of had like a general idea of what was going on, but I would still say there's definitely a learning curve that comes with just like knowing your campus and knowing your surroundings and even just like knowing the city that you're in. Unfortunately, uh, we're in October and I have yet to really like experience Durham, North Carolina. And so like, that's always a little bit tough, but I would say the toughest thing for me about just like college in general is you don't have a structured eight hour school day like you guys have in, in high school. And like I once had, it's kind of like, okay, you know, your classes meet X, Y, Z time on Monday and Thursday, or, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday or whatever. Usually it's like Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or, or something like that. And so you have like these set times that your classes meet and then you have all this other time on your hands and you're like, well, what do I, what do I do with that? Do I, you know, a lot of people get caught up in the, in the social scene. Fortunately, we've had COVID. So it's like, well, not fortunately we've had COVID, but like COVID has provided the, the benefit of, well, we don't really have to, um, we don't have as much social stuff going on. So it's easier for us to, to stay on track, but that's definitely a point where me just like figuring out how to manage my time and, and how to be self-disciplined in, in a different type of environment where I don't have that structure of my butt needs to be in a seat at a desk you know, at X, Y, Z time, it's a little bit different. So kind of figuring out a schedule and figuring out my routine and knowing this is when I'm going to do my schoolwork. And this is when it's me time. To take, you know, this is when I'm going to allow myself to take time for me, just finding that balance. So I hope that answers your question. I have one. My name is Chastity. You probably can't see me because I'm on this part. Wait, my question is due to COVID, just because that you're on campus, do you have on-campus classes or are your classes online? Yeah, so what we have here at Duke, and this this will differ at, at whatever college that, that you're at or other colleges are doing things that are different. But yeah, what we have here is is a hybrid model. So for I have four classes, four and a half, um, that I'm taking, and one of them is completely virtual and all of, actually two of them are completely virtual and all of the other ones have like the other two and a half have some sort of like virtual plus an in-person component. So that's been my experience. I would just like to add HBU is um, similar. They go on campus for labs and then classroom is virtual. So they also have a hybrid. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. It, and it definitely depends on, most schools are probably doing at least a, a hybrid if you're on campus. Right. Um, any other questions for me? Okie dokie. All right, well, we'll go ahead and, and continue on. And if you have questions, just feel free to jump in. Um, and I, like I said, I'll leave a little bit of time at the end as well for you to, to pick my brain a little bit. but. One thing that I wanted to just address in regards to participation in the college environment is a lot of um, a lot of humanities classes definitely kind of want to stimulate this, this environment of academic discussion and academic conversation where they open up the floor for everybody to, to really contribute and to say what's on their mind and say what's on their heart. And 
it's been tough in in the age of COVID where it's like awkward via Zoom because it's like sometimes you interrupt somebody else and it's just kind kind of weird. But I would say at least two of my classes are actually three, actually all of them, to be honest, all of them. Part of my grade is based on my participation. Am I piping up and am I speaking in class? Right. And so kind of this just this delicate balance that you have that, that connects back to communication uh, is I have a, a few tenets for productive conversation, for productive communication and dialogue that I've been um, that have really been reinforced here in the college atmosphere. And that is number one, doing deep listening right like i said communication is a two-way street it involves the person that's actually doing the communicating the person that's doing the perceiving and so when you're on the perceiving end you need to make sure that you're actually listening and processing what the person is saying and, and that you have a, a clear headspace to you know you're not thinking about all of your other commitments and all of your other responsibilities and obligations but that you are fully giving your attention to whatever that person is saying so that you can appropriately respond now on this note of responding to what somebody is saying uh, in, in a conversation, you, you also want to make sure that as the listener, that you're not listening with the intent to respond, right? Because the thing with that is if you're listening just with the intent of like, okay, this is what I'm going to say after and I like, it might not even relate to what they have to say, that is not going to move the conversation forward at all whatsoever. So purely listening, just to absorb and to hear whatever somebody else is saying, and then allowing it to kind of circulate in your brain a little bit and then figuring out, okay, this is what I want to say in response to what they're saying. Not just like shoving your own perspective down somebody's throat and just being like, that this might not even relate to what the conversation is at hand. But I just wanted to say this, right? That's not, that's not appropriate. Another kind of um, tenet for having a, a very productive conversation is this, this mantra of speaking up and stepping back, so, right? Raising your hand when you have something insightful, something productive, something meaningful to say, raise your hand and say it, right? Volunteer it and, and you make the conversation a little bit more lively. But at the same time, be a conversation hog, right? For those of you who play sports, nobody likes a ball hog. Nobody likes the person that's just like, you know, only wants to be the only one wants to be the only one who's dribbling down the court or dribbling down the soccer field or whatever, right? You want to make sure that you are contributing, but that you're also stepping back and recognizing, okay, I have maybe some shyer people in the room who have something uh, that's on their heart, that have something that they want to say, and I've made way for them to say something by stepping back and just kind of falling into the, to the shadows for a little bit, since you've already said kind of what's on your head on what's on your mind so speaking up and also recognizing when it's appropriate to to step back and not hogging space right and the last thing that i wanted to, to kind of mention is that you want to when you're saying something when you're communicating with somebody sometimes our words come out and it's not always perceived the way that we meant them right but you want to be sure that you apologize for, and this, this might be a little bit of a tongue twister, so I'm going to say it slowly. Apologize for impact, not intent. So if you have offended somebody with the words that you have said, do not make the excuse, well, I didn't mean it like that. I don't want it to come across as offensive. Like, that's not, you know, my, my heart was in a good place. Bottom line is, you offended the person. You hurt their feelings. Let let it doesn't matter what your intentions are. Sometimes good intentions are just not enough. And the other person was sensitive to what you said and it hurt them. So apologize for the impact, the negative impact that you've had and not your intent, because sometimes good intentions are not enough. Right. And I know I said that was my last thing. But the other one thing that I want to say that really extends beyond college, beyond high school, really for the rest of your life is there's never a stupid question. Right. So never be afraid to just raise your hand and seek clarification because guaranteed at least some other person in the room is having the same thing on their mind and is also just not wanting to speak up. So it's better to ask for help, get the clarification and make sure that you're on the right track than just continue operating and doing the wrong thing. Right. So never think that there is a stupid question or never think that you asking a question makes you look stupid. Right. Now, I want to move into a little bit here to the importance of just building rapport with your teachers, right? Building rapport with really anybody that you're working with. So this is your teachers in high school. This is your professors when you get to college. This is your boss and your coworkers when you get a job, if you have a job now, 
right? So specifically to teachers, though, because we're all, you know, in academia here, we're, we're in a school scholastic environment. So let's focus on that first. And that is, how, well, how do you build rapport with your teacher? What, is, what does that even mean, right? So it involves, first and foremost, showing your teacher that you care, right? Number one way to build rapport is do your work, okay? Turn in your stuff on time. Um, you know, put your best foot forward, contribute in class, do what they're asking of you. Meet and surpass their expectations, right? That's the number one way to build rapport on a, on a fundamental level. Because your teacher is not going to want to have a relationship with you that extends beyond the classroom if you're somebody that's lazy and does not give a care about their class at all. So showing them that you care is number one. Number two is making yourself known, right? So what that means is sometimes it's a little bit hard to, it's, it's, it's very actually it's easy to get lost in the shuffle and to kind of fade in the background when you have a really large class. And, and especially when you get to college, there are going to be lecture halls of hundreds of students. And you might end up, if you don't speak up, if you don't make yourself known, you might just become a number on the teacher's you know, grade book or in their portfolio. And you want to be more than that. You want to be a name to a face. And so how do you make yourself known? Well, there are multiple ways. Like I said, one, just doing your work and showing that you care. Two, going to office hours. So in, in college, there's a thing where outside of class, teachers have set up time for you to come and visit with them and talk about you know, what's on your mind or something maybe that, that's you know, difficult or a challenging concept. In high school, there's the same type of thing where it's not a formal office hours, but you can schedule a meeting with your teacher to say, hey, I'm very confused about this. Do you mind if I come in and see clarification? So doing that is another way to, for you to show that you care and also allow your teacher to kind of get to know you outside of just the normal classroom environment. Another way for you to, um, is another way for you to make yourself known to your teacher is literally by viewing them as more than just a teacher. Okay, because a lot of us teens have this, this misconception that teachers are just, you know, they eat, breathe, sleep, school, right? But the thing is, is they're human, just like you and me. They have responsibilities and kids and spouses and families and pets and jobs and other things that they're juggling outside of them just grading your papers and showing up to class to, to share information with you, right? They have other things that, that they're passionate about. They have a favorite movie, a favorite hobby, you know, things that they, maybe they majored in in math in college but ended up teaching you know reading finding out about that stuff being genuinely interested in getting to know your teacher in a sincere way might i add will also go a long way and so that means when you walk into the classroom hey miss carp what's going on how are you today or hey miss carp you, you look a little stressed is everything all right just being perceptive of those things but also like i said being sincere you never want to give your teacher the vibe that you're just trying to brown nose or or be overly chummy to to receive some sort of advantage this all needs to be natural just like you get to know a you know another adult I, i'm very mindful to not say friend right but just like you get to know a, a person in general treat your teacher, teacher with that same respect and, and also view them as a person as well right you know the reason that that building rapport with your teachers goes a really long way is because Number one, your teachers are more likely if you go and you demonstrate interest and you, you know, you want to talk about a grade and, and, and ask them for feedback and stuff like that. When you demonstrate that interest and you kind of get to know them beyond the just merely superficial level, that makes it more likely that your teacher is going to support you both in and outside of the classroom. So what do I mean by that? Well, if your teacher knows you and really does know you, they're probably going to be more, more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, if, if they see that you've submitted some really sloppy work and they know that you're a star student, they're, if they know you, they're probably going to pull you aside. Maybe, hey, McKinney, stay after class today. Let me, I, I need to talk to you about something. And then be like, hey, what happened with this assignment, right? They're, they're not going to just write you off because they have that relationship with you at that point, right? Another way that they might support you inside of the classroom is if you know them, they might be more likely to give you some sort of grace and mercy if you have a lot of stuff on your plate and need some sort of extension or need a deadline to be pushed back. Now, I'm very careful when I say this as well, because the thing is, is 
teachers have deadlines for a reason. You know, they maybe need to, you know, meet their own deadlines and they need you to be on time with your stuff so that they can submit your midterm grades or, you know, get the stuff in before the cycle closes or whatever. So teachers are, they're not trying to hurt you with these deadlines, but they're usually in place for a reason and they're usually timed for a reason. But anyways, what I was saying was building rapport with your teachers, they may give you a little bit more mercy with those deadlines just because they know your circumstances, right? But I said I'm careful to say that because your teachers don't owe you a thing, right? So if you find yourself asking for an extension or something, there are two things I want you to keep in mind. One, do not ever demand something from your teacher. You you ask, you inquire, you humble yourself because who's in control in the classroom? Who who is is the, the master of your grade or who's the one that's kind of, you know, the the, pup, the the puppet master behind the strings? That is your teacher. They have full full complete authority. Meaning they can easily just tell you, "No. I don't care. I like you, girl, or I like you, boy, but like no, deadline is what it is. So don't come in there being like guns a blazing teacher. You owe me this teacher. You know, I need a, I need an extension. Like, you know, you're being unfair ne because that's really just going to set you behind the eight ball tremendously. If you come in with that, that attitude, knowing who's in charge and humbling yourself and, and asking and explaining yourself potentially might open the door for you getting an extension. But even then, never is a guarantee. The second thing I want you to keep in mind is if, by the grace of God, your teacher gives you some mercy with a deadline. By the grace of God, because like I said, I wouldn't expect anything, right? Uh -huh. Never take advantage of that. If they've given you a free pass one time, you need to just think of that as your one free pass because nobody likes to be taken advantage of. Nobody likes to feel like their kindness is being abused and, and overused, right? So being like, okay, I got my one free pass and now I need to get my stuff together. Because like I said, your teachers, they under, and everybody's in the same boat. Everybody has commitments and, and obligations and responsibilities outside of your work. And it's not your teacher's job to accommodate your schedule because they got their own stuff going on. So if they have given you that leniency, take it the one-time thing and move on, right? Because you coming back, asking for more is definitely not going to do you any sorts of favors. Now, support outside of the classroom as far as it goes when um, you, you build rapport with your teachers. Well, your teachers more, if they know you, more likely to write a really positive, glowing letter of recommendation about you. They are more likely to kind of notify you of different opportunities that align with your interests and your passions. If, you're, if your teacher knows that you're somebody who, for example, I'm somebody that's really passionate about the educational achievement gap that exists between lower income students of color and higher income white students. And so a lot of my teachers here, I've talked to them about that and they know that. And so because I've taken that opportunity to build rapport with them and get to know them and go to their office hours or whatever, I've gotten emails from my teacher saying, hey, we're doing a, a meeting today with all of the um, doctorates of education on campus, and I want you to come and sit in, and, and maybe you, you you benefit from being in that space. It's about putting yourself in the right spaces, and when you have a relationship with your teacher, they might be more willing to help you get into those spaces and to connect. And let me with add you. to that. Like, like, some of you, some of you already know. Like, if I know your personality and what your um, your goal is, what you're working towards, I've already reached out to you and said, hey. There's a scholarship you should apply for. You know, I've said, hey, there's this opportunity coming up. Do you want to be a part of it? So some of, some of you already know building a rapport with some of your teachers who have connections is really beneficial. It really is. So there you go, y'all. You see, I'm not just speaking out my rear end here and just saying random things. Ms. Carp just gave an example. Okay, so this is real stuff that I'm talking about, and it's actually really important. Now, moving on to my last theme for today. And then I'll open it up to questions because I know I have till about 117 with you guys, 217 my time. Is what do we expect in the workforce? What do we expect when we get a job? How is all this communication stuff going to come into, into play? <clears throat> and really, it's quite simple. It's quite simple, people. You are forever going to be interacting with people, people who are on your level. So like your, you know, your equals, your coworkers, right? You're going to be interacting with your superiors, right? Your boss, people who are your authority, your authority figure in a certain environment, people who are further uh, along in the, um, 
like people who have actually already navigated the path that you're going down, right? So people who are a little bit higher on that, that ladder of expertise, right? You're going to be forever networking. You're going to be forever giving presentations, you know, whether that's me voluntarily or at your job where they're like, hey, Billy Bob, you're going to be, you know, presenting this to the team today. So be ready, right? My mom, she's a pharmaceutical sales rep. And all throughout quarantine, I saw her, you know, doing her little Zoom presentations online. So you guys will... You have to embrace it because it's going to be happening for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Even if you're in a cubicle job, more than likely you might have to say some words at a team meeting, right? Uh, you, like I said, you're going to be you're going to be forever a part of teams, working with others. You're going to be forever getting interviews, right? Especially when you you first are fresh out of college and fresh out of high school, or you know you're looking for internships. Interviews are going to stick with you for the rest of your life. And also, once you reach a certain level of um, of um, authority or once you've kind of established yourself in a particular arena the roles might change and you might be the one actually doing the interview so you're interviewing those you know new spring chickens on the scene right so all of what well, all of that goes to show is that you're forever going to be interacting with people so mastering these skills of you know being articulate when you're speaking demonstrating body language that shows that you're attentive that you're interested that you're engaged that you're confident right also when you're writing, now, I'm not saying you're going to be writing essays for the rest of your life, but something that you will be doing for the rest of your life is sending emails. That is something that is going to stick with you forever and ever and ever. Like, even if you, even if you don't want to like actually have a real job, you're still probably going to be sending emails to people. So the thing is, is mastering that art of written communication is also really important. And we are going to spend a brief amount of time also kind of discussing what that is and, and that'll help us close things out for today. Now, email sending. The first thing that I want to say is kind of on this note is, and, and it relates to communication at large, is identifying what is best appropriate, um, is, is most appropriate and most suitable to a con to a particular context. And so what I mean by that is if you are, maybe you're trying to organize an event or something, right? And you know that it'll be easier and more efficient to collect details for that event over the phone or in a meeting versus sending an email, you need to be aware of that, right? So also if you're doing an, a, a survey or something like that, or you're doing some sort of interview, interviews are in person because it's easier to talk about this stuff and meaning doesn't get um, misconstrued as it, can, as it can be over email. So just identifying when it's appropriate to actually pick up the phone and call somebody or meet somebody in person or send an email is always, it's going to go a long way because trust me, if you just have a bunch of questions on your mind, I'm sure Miss Carp will, and, and I definitely feel like this, I appreciate more if somebody just will like call me and talk to me versus just asking me a million billion questions all in one email, right? I'm, I'm busy, you're busy, um, but it really just depends on the person and it really just depends on the context. So really being mindful of that. To give you an example, just this girl just emailed me the other day. She said, hey, McKinley, I have a bunch of questions about uh, what it means to take a gap year and what your experience has been. Uh, we can go on email or you can text me. I texted her and said, hey, let's set up a meeting for this Sunday because I prefer to just, it's, it'll be more efficient of use of my time and her time if she can just ask me all her questions in one go instead of me just going back and forth back and forth because she already has all these questions on her mind right so and then when she just has like maybe a one-off question down the line then she can email me right so understanding that and also knowing that it's pretty common for email meaning to potentially get lost via email or lost via text because you can't always put a voice behind it and so sometimes people might be like "Ooh." I was coming across a little curt versus if you had, there's a difference in me saying like, I can't even really give an example right now, but like saying a sentence very dryly versus if I have my energy behind it um, that you can perceive when you're actually hearing my voice, right? Uh, another thing that you want to be mindful of when it comes to email sending is do not get fancy with the and really in the body of the email as well, just get straight to the point, right? Email is supposed to be a quick like little thing where somebody reads it and does a quick response. They don't really care about all of that flowery, you know, it's a really beautiful day outside and like all that stuff. Like no, nobody wants to read that. 
Tell me why I literally start my emails. Hi, so-and-so hope all is well. The reason I'm reaching out is because blah, blah, blah. I'm not trying to waste their time and I'm not trying to waste my time. And even with the subject lines, make it incentivize the person to open it, but you don't need to have a bunch going on. It needs to be very simple and, and straight to the point. Uh, like I said earlier, but I'm going to be very explicit about it when I say it now is don't ask too many questions in your email, right? If you have 10 questions that you want answered, maybe it's better that you pick up the phone. If you have a couple Okay, that's that's fine. But the, the thing is, is the more questions you ask, the likelihood that they're all going to get answered, it's just going to go down and down and down. Because trust me, nobody's sitting there reading your essay. I mean, reading your email like it's going to be graded. So it's more of a skim type of thing. Okay, I got the gist. Let me respond. So don't think that you're going to get all of your stuff answered if you're asking 20 or so questions in your thing. Right. Also, you're going to want to pay attention to formatting in your email so maybe that's being mindful of your text size i usually i like to make my text a little bit bigger so that it's easier on the other person's eyes and that they don't miss key information be mindful of your font type why are you gonna have a font that's really hard to read like a, a random cursive like you don't want this person to be straining to read your email likely that they're going to respond in a timely fashion just goes down, right? You also want to break up your information into paragraphs. Don't just have a big block of like 50 sentences. Your email should not even be 50 sentences at all. But like if it's 20 sentences, maybe breaking that up into five paragraphs of four sentences or four paragraphs of five sentences or something like that. Even that's pushing it. That's a little long, but, but just breaking your stuff up so that it's easy on the eyes. Also, making sure that in instructing your paragraphs, Put the important information at the beginning. By the time somebody gets to the end of your of your paragraph or the end of your email and they haven't found the main idea, they're gonna be like, I don't know what this person wants from me. Move on, I'm not responding, right? So put the information up front. This is why I'm reaching out and then put your details after so that the person knows what to expect. Also, making sure that your tone in your email is the three Ps, right? Polite, professional, and proof read. Right. So you want to be polite. You want to be kind in your email. You want to keep things professional. Even if you're emailing a friend on email, I don't know who's going back and you know, Google might be looking at my stuff. I don't know who could potentially if I run for, you know, a political candidacy and they have access to my emails. I'm not trying to have any funny business on email, even if it's to somebody I know. So keeping your stuff professional is always going to be a long way. But especially if you're talking to a superior, do not talk to Miss Carp or another teacher or somebody, or some type of authority figure or somebody you do not know, like they're your buddy. You know, not spelling out words completely, abbreviating things. It's just not. It's not going to serve you at all, right? And the last thing, proofread. Okay. Read your stuff a couple of times and make sure that you don't have anything in there that's, you know, grammatically incorrect or misspellings. Like, show that you care, right? And also, just on this note of being polite and professional, I would have, uh, I advise that you stay away from figurative language in email. Like I said, I'm a big figurative language gal, but uh, in emails, it's very easy for that stuff to just get misconstrued and taken out of context. So the more literal you can be, the better, right? greeting closing making sure that you're saying hello to the person especially if you're emailing them as a new thread right hey or not even hey hey is is very informal but hello good afternoon hi or whatever right and having a closing as well best thanks sincerely whatever even a potentially even a hyphen um depending on who it is that you're communicating with and also last thing before i open it up to questions for you guys is emails are not like text messages Meaning, you know, we have we, we have the expectation that somebody responds to our text within a matter of, of hours or even minutes, right? It's a, it's a quick thing. But via, via email, that's a very, it's a business platform, right? So have patience with people. Give them three, five business days before you follow up, right? And it depends on the urgency of the matter. That would depend if maybe instead of sending up a follow-up email, you just call and say, hey, I sent you an email a few days ago. This event is coming up on Friday. You kind of have to just be you mindful of your contacts in those situations, but just being aware that it, it is not received well by anybody. If you send me an email at five o'clock today and I haven't responded by 10 o'clock that night, don't 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 send somebody an email saying, hey, I didn't hear from you from five hours ago. That's just, it. it it's not going to be received well. Um, so that's kind of what I have for you in terms of communication. Remember, like I said, the three parts of communication are your verbal communication, 
are your written communication and the communication um, via your body language. So kind of making sure to incorporate all these strategies that I shared with you today as you move forward is going to serve you well. I promise you that. And um, with that, I want to see kind of what questions you guys have for me at this point. And honestly, it can be about anything. Like, it doesn't even have to be related to communication. It can just be about college, school, whatever. Do you like being away from home? <sighs> that's, a, that's a tough question. So I would say at this point, I've been away from home since August 8th, right? And I've, uh, I've been away from home before. Before coming to college, I've gone eight weeks without seeing my parents, without seeing my family and without, you know, the comforts of, of being at my home base. But I would say that this has been tough for me because I know that I've entered a new era of my life in that I'm never going to, starting now, or, you know, starting when I first came to college, um, there will never be another point where I'm at home for longer than a period of a couple of months, right? So I'm officially kind of like, one foot is out the door now and i i'm i'm just no longer going to be living at home and so that's tough as well because it's just like you know wow i've entered adulthood um but like i miss my family and i miss my cat and i'm, I'm happy that like my parents they have they came to visit me for my birthday which was on the 17th which was really nice um but yeah it has been tough to like not see them and to just kind of like be in this environment especially now like as a freshman where i don't know a lot of people on that very intimate level that like you guys as seniors your friends that you that you have you've been buddies with them for years at this point me I've only known these people for a couple of months now right and so they don't really know like the inner depths of my soul and so it's just like some of these relationships are still really superficial and it's like hard to like fully let your hair down a lot of the time so yeah it's been a little tough what happened to late birthday Thank you. <laughs> Let me ask you guys a question. Um, and you guys just feel free to, to pipe up here. But like, what are you most nervous about going into into college? I know on the classes to take. Say again. The track. Yeah. Not yeah. knowing which classes to take, like the track mm -hmm. for their majors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's definitely. Um, Fair. And what I say in regards to that is like there at any college, there are going to be people who are in place who their job is to help you choose classes. Right. I have a college advisor who I just met with this last this past week and or last week. And I just talked to her about, hey, like this is what I'm interested in. How do I make this work with my schedule? What classes are going to enable me to like do things that I care about, but also kind of reach the requirements or meet the requirements of, of the school? So don't be worried about that. It's a learning curve experience, but no reason to be worried. Other concerns that you guys have? So what are you most excited about um, in terms of going into college and, and starting that, that next step of your life? Think about myself. Okay, so leaving let me Houston. You said leaving Houston? Yeah, agreed, agreed. I when I got into uh, Rice, I was like, oh yeah, this is a really good school, but like I'm trying to get out of here. I'm trying to like experience a new state, a state that actually gets snow and has four seasons and and the leaves change color. Cause y'all know Houston is hot all the time. Even during like the winter, it's like cool. It doesn't even really get cold. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with that as well. Now for the person that said being alone, what are you, what, what are you going to do when you have to have a roommate? How are you going to handle that? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, no, I want to hear an answer. Luckily, well, so you're probably like, man, she's getting real loud if she does have a roommate. Luckily, no, I don't because just because of COVID. If COVID weren't a thing, I would most certainly have a roommate this year because it's just a mandatory thing for all first year students. And I was not looking forward to that at all because the little like seven questions that they asked me, like 
Do you want a roommate that smokes? Do you want a roommate that drinks? Do you want a roommate that wakes up early? Do you want a roommate that's, or it was like seven of these generic questions. I was like, how are you gonna find somebody that just like fits with me based on seven criteria, three of them being about, do I care about a roommate that drinks? Right, so luckily I don't have a roommate this year, which has made my life so much easier because I can like study in my room and stuff. But I'm having one next year, so wish me luck. And I'm, you guys will probably have one too, maybe. I started off with three roommates. Yep, we had a, a two bedroom kind of um, sweet, 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 campus sweet. apartment. Mm -hmm. Then I ended up with two, just two, and then where we shared the same bathroom. And then I finally got to one where it was, we had two uh, roommates on opposite sides of the room and we only shared the kitchen. See, that's just tough. Like even here, we have, um, I don't have a roommate, but I share a bathroom with 10 girls and girls in the room, y'all can attest to the fact that girls are messy. Okay, like guys are messy too, I guess. But like, you know, girls like just leave their hair in the drain, you know, hair on the walls, you know, just are not like flushing the toilet. It's just nasty. That's and why I stay in the door. <laughs> no, it's just, it's not it. Say it again. Like, did y'all say when you got to clean the or anything like that? Yes, um, in my experience, um, we would, yes, each week we would rotate uh, chores. And that's when we had, that's when I had four roommates. When I had two roommates, it was basically you use your stuff, I use my stuff. We don't have yeah. a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and here, luckily, like I said, I'm in my own little room. So all the chores like fall on my shoulders. If I want to be a bum, I be a bum. I'm not trying to be a bum though. So like, you know, I do my laundry every week and vacuum and I don't really have a good filter in my room. So like, I always have dust. Like I'm having just like dust all the time so that I'm not sneezing in here. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the way it goes when you have like other people that you're living with, making sure that they're cleaning up after themselves because it's nasty. It can be. Yes. It it can definitely be nasty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask you guys this. Um, so, how many of you have like, you're like y'all are done, like you're done with all of your college um, application stuff? You're just like waiting at this point. I'm finished. Woo Woohoo! <laughs> okay, that is proactivity at its finest. So you're kind of just waiting now, huh? Yeah. Okay. What, I have you a student, not in this, not in this class, but she's already been accepted and everything. Just waiting. Mm -hmm. Really, at this point, she's already been accepted. Already been accepted and just That's waiting. Nice. <laughs> wow, that really, that really must be nice. Like I didn't apply early anywhere, and so like when early decision people were like saying, I guess it was in November when they came out with their stuff. Um, they were like, yeah, like this is where I'm going to school. I had to wait like all the way until, well. Duke told me about my acceptance in March. They like sent me an email and were just like, hey, like you can expect to receive an uh, acceptance letter. Yeah, yeah, which it was strange. It was strange because this is how I found out about my acceptance to Duke. I was expecting to like find out in May or whatever, you know, like the normal time. And I was like on my way to the movies, you know, like this was over spring break. I was like chilling, whatever. And I like get this email saying like Duke admissions whatever. And so I just like open it up. I'm like, wait, what could this be? Like, I'm not really sure. And like, it was them basically saying like, hey, we were really impressed with your stuff. You can expect um, an acceptance from us in May or whatever. So like, I knew at that point that I had already been accepted to, to, to Duke at least. Um, but, but that was just like fortunate because like, obviously that wasn't an expectation that I had, you know? So that's another reason to stand out in your essays and uh, have extracurricular activities. Right. Like you said earlier, do something that shows that you care about the betterment of people. And then they yeah. can focus on that and go, we really want her to be a part of us because she might participate in something we have on campus that's going to make our school look good. That's right. That's right. That's what colleges care about. They care about the reason they ask for your grades and your SAT scores is because they want to make sure that you can actually handle the work here. Right, that you're not going to fail and flunk or whatever, and that you're going to pass your classes. And then the second thing is they care about participation. They want a student body who is engaged and, and who wants to be a part of clubs and who wants to, you know, identify areas for change on campus and, and take action and make things happen. And so that's what your extracurriculars show. So, you know, I know you guys might think, like, why do they care about all of this stuff? But it's, it's really with that, um, that mentality at the back of their mind. 
Yeah. Well, I thank you, Mackenzie. We're running out of time. So okay, no worries. <laughs> Again, guys, your exit ticket is on the hub. You'll see it. It says third period 1028. OK, so you'll talk about um, basically what Miss um, Mackenzie Warren was talking to you about. And again, thank you again. I think you gave really great advice. Okay. And um, again, guys, if you still have questions, you can just let me know. I can shoot her. And did you want to share that website? With yes, 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 I will. So my website that you can you can get a hold of me via this um, is www.maack school so s c h o o l prep p r e p dot com and if you have any questions go to my contact page it'll shoot right to my inbox um and i will get in touch with you so yeah Was you m as in mary or n as in nancy m as in mary okay got it yep you got it and it was a pleasure talking to you guys today i really appreciate it thank you again have okay. a good afternoon. <laughs> All right, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.